Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. How's everyone doing? Great, right? Everything's fucking great. (laughs) Oh Lord. Um, So here we are. We are in our final week of our sex and intimacy month. And I'm really excited to bring you this conversation that I had uh, with my dear friend, Libby Leidecker, also known as Dea Carr. Um, Dea is a, Dea Carr, uh, Libby is a Kundalini yoga teacher. Um, and she has been teaching Kundalini for 13 years. Um, she's also a spiritual life coach and a conscious sexuality podcaster. She has a podcast called Sexual Alchemy with Dea Carr that I was on a few months ago. <laughs> when safety allows, she's an international retreat leader. Uh, <laughs> remember when we used to be able to go on retreats and go to other countries? <sighs> so through the technology of Kundalini Yoga and conscious self-authorized empowerment, Libby helps guide her students and clients to finding that their solutions come from within. Um, she really believes that our best answers are found when we give our higher self space and freedom from the clutter of our conditioning and social prescriptions. Oh, ain't that the truth, man. I met Libby through our dear friend, Susan Guthrie, who uh, I've had on the co- podcast a couple times. And you know that I do a weekly um, Facebook live stream with, um, her and, um, Ben and Nikki over at our happy divorce. I immediately fell in love with <laughs> Libby. I w- immediately was like, okay. And now we're friends. <laughs> and we, fortunately she felt the same way. And, you know, one of the things I want to say about, you know, I'm, I know I'm always saying how much I love my podcast guests and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that I tend not to bring people on the podcast that I actually, that I don't know, um, that I don't have some kind of relationship with. I, I get a lot of people, um, you know, send a lot of like publicists and, and stuff like that will email me and ask me to have their clients on my podcast. And it's very rare that I do that. Um, because I don't like interviewing people that I don't have a relationship with that I don't really understand who they are. And you can tell those podcast interviews that I've done in the past where it like doesn't seem like we're all that related or I don't really know that much about them. The conversation just doesn't flow as well. So when I say like, I love this person and they were really good friends, it's true. <laughs> it's really true. I, uh, I adore, I, I loved having this conversation with Libby. We actually, we recorded this podcast a long time ago, long before COVID. And I pushed Sex and Intimacy Month out when COVID struck because I was like, oh my God, who's thinking about, who's thinking about sex right now when we like, can't even like see anyone, um, outside of our own spheres. And sometimes we don't want to have sex with the people that are in our spheres. I sure don't. Um, so (laughs) anyway, um, so I pushed this out. So we did have this conversation long before COVID, but, um, I think it's still, it's just as relevant, just as timely, just as important. So, uh, without further ado, here's my conversation with the beautiful and lovely Libby Leidecker, also known as Dea Carr. Hi, Libby. Thank you so much for coming on and talk to, talking to us about all things Kundalini and and other things and sexual alchemy 
and sexual alchemy. Don't forget that. Don't Should forget. <laughs> I'm happy to be here with you. Thank you. I am. Um, so, okay. Uh, I want to define a couple. I want to start off with defining a couple of things. What is yeah. Kundalini yoga? What? How does it differentiate from other forms of yoga? Um, and then I want you to define and tell me what, tell us about sexual alchemy. Cause I personally just full disclosure before we hit record, we were talking <laughs> about sexual alchemy and I was like, I want to know, <laughs> I want to know what the sexual alchemy is. Yes. It's a uh, eyebrow raising. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, yes. Kundalini, Kundalini energy is what lies dormant in the base of our spine of every human being. So it is this atomic energy mm. that was within every human being. Kundalini yoga is an ancient technology that helps to activate that primal energy at the base of your spine. Mm. In doing so, it moves the energy up your chakra system. We have seven chakras from the base of the spine to the crown of the head, and then the eighth chakra, the electromagnetic field, which is our aura. The exercises, which are kriyas, which is a combination of exercises, mantra, which is chanting sound currents that activate different glands in the brain, uh, different uh, chemicals in the brain, and um, breath work. So the combination of those three things make up kundalini yoga. Um, and so it's a very powerful technology to raise and activate that energy. And so you've probably heard the term nirvana, right? That kind of spiritual ecstasy. That is the goal in many ways of a Kundalini practice is to awaken the higher centers, which is above the heart, activating the heart center and opening to that feeling that is our birth. That is part of all of us. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, in many ways, it's, it's very non-assuming and not overly, you know, complicated, but um, it's very powerful energy. And so it's, it's an honor to teach it. I've been teaching for 13 years now. Yeah. And I mean, I will say that I, you know, since, since we first met um, a few months ago, I guess it was, yeah. um, I've been like, I, I, you know, I keep, Kundalini is the kind, something that's been sort of dropping around my, my world for the last couple of years. And I've always been like, oh, okay, that's nice. Or that's for, that's for other people or whatever. Right. And then when I met you, I, it, it just sort of, it took root in a different way for me to want to explore it. And I think I talked to you about it at the time. I was like, well, where do you teach and how can I, and um, and then this quarantine happened and I thought, you know what, now is the time. Now is definitely the time. And I was really called to it. And so I've only, you know, as you know, like started this journey, like, I don't know, like a week and a half ago or so, <laughs> two weeks ago, maybe I'm finding it unlike any other kind of yoga because it's not a, it's not, it's not unphysical, but it's far more about breath. Right. than it is about, you know, going into stretchy poses or anything like that, right? It's like, it, it feels to me like the yoga of the breath, in a sense. I, I'm loving it. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it to the point where I'm like, oh, I, I'm going, I, I'm going to do this now. Mm -hmm. Like this is, you know, so mm -hmm. thank you for bringing it into my life. And yeah, and I will say that in sort of touching on it in some small way, almost every day now, I feel that, you know, especially in this time when things are so, you know, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, mm -hmm. when we're, we're recording this in the middle of quarantine, mm -hmm. that it's, I'm finding it very grounding and, and also elevating, right? It's that, yes. right? Yeah. Like yeah. grounding and elevating, grounding and elevating. That's sort of my, my really, really novice experience <laughs> of this. That is an amazing description. Because, and, and to your point that I can explain it theoretically, right? What it's designed to do, right. but the most important thing is your experience of it. Why the experience is so powerful is because that is how we learn and change, right? Yeah. We can read something in theory. Like we've all done that with a self-help book, for example, right? Underline, underline, exclamation point, dog-eared everything. Right. I'm going to be a woman when I walk away from this book. And then a week later... 
Yeah, in right. theory, it all makes sense, but it hasn't inherently changed us. What I right. find the magic of this practice is, and what I have been practicing it myself for 22 years, teaching it for 13, I have seen, not only in myself, but in so many students and so many friends and colleagues, major transformational growth happen because it's an introspective yoga. It's not about your body. It's not about the postures necessarily or your physicality. It works on your glandular system. It works on your nervous system and it works on your subconscious mind. And the subconscious, when we are not aware of it, right? It's this peripheral part of ourselves that is often the driving force through a lot of the decision-making, a lot of our reactions, right? We're still in that yes. reactive where we can be jerked around by life circumstances. When we take over the driver's seat of our own consciousness by being more subtle, by going inward. Kundalini yoga is practiced a lot of, most of it with your eyes closed. We are mm -hmm. so extroverted as a society that when we get the chance to be more introverted, we can relate more to our subtle nature and in doing so, heal the old wounds and then also begin to navigate from our inner GPS system, which is our intuition at your third eye point mm -hmm. and your gut brain, right? At your solar plexus and your heart, the wisdom of your heart center is so much wiser than any intellectualism that we can ponder, right? Yep. I love this. You know, the very first thing that I do with all of my clients and the first thing that I do with in all of my programs is um, an inner guide visualization. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this would actually, I would love to add a sort of a, a different a sort of a, a Kundalini-esque sort of uh, meditation to it as well, because that's, that's the entire purpose of the first modules of my program, right? Is getting in touch with that intuition. Yeah. Because especially in my work, right? Should I stay or should I go? Yeah. We know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We know. You know, if you check in, when you drop in mm -hmm. and you connect to that intuition, you know what you need to do. Sure. Right. And, and it's that, as you said, that sort of extra version or all the chatter or the inner critic, right. That, that overwhelms that mm -hmm. and our connection to that into our own intuition is so, um, fragmented right. by all of the outside noise. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that, that dropping in to that connection is, is the most, I think it's the most important and profound thing we can do as, as humans. Absolutely. I mean, for sure. It, it, and in some ways, the most difficult work, right? And, and look at what we're being given right now in the middle of this pandemic, right? How much chasing have we done? How much seeking and following and carrot chasing, right? There's always something new on the horizon. Our obsession with consumerism, our, our giving away our power in so many ways, especially as women, because we, we both really focus on women's consciousness. Um, and what is the gift we're being given right now to go inward? And in doing so, right. facing a lot of the things that perhaps we've been avoiding or running away from with our busyness, our glamorization of busyness, which is what we do yes. as a society. So now here we are in the introspection, all of us, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And what are we going to find there? Right. It's, it's, it's yes. work. It's so important. Yeah. Mother Earth is like, it's time. It's yeah, we talked about this yesterday. You know, we were talking about the this this idea of, of of nurturing that this is a period of time where we're kind of being forced, we're being forced inward, we're being forced into our homes, in into these uncomfortable places in ourselves where we're just with our own selves, mm -hmm. where we're kind of being forced into self-nurturance. Yeah. Yeah. And this is such a, I think, a profound and powerful practice to bring to that. I wanted to go back to something else you said about you always feeling like there was like Kundalini, for example, was in your peripheral. It was kind of around, you'd heard it, you'd taken it in, and it never felt like it was for you. And I taught beginners classes and I would always ask people what, what brought you in for the first time? Because I was always curious. Uh -huh. Um, because it yeah. is a particular practice. It's it's really something that you're either ready for or you're not. You know, and mm -hmm. when you're ready mm -hmm. for it, you're ready to grab onto the rocket ship and transcend um, and to really do the work because it's it's no quick fix solution because it's you working on you 
Now, yeah, not only you can't escape the most <laughs> effective, right? You can't escape. And it's also, you can't give your power away um, to anyone else. It's not someone right. else or something else or a guru or a teacher or a therapist or whatever fixing you. It's you remembering that you already had it all along, right? It's you remembering your connection to source. It's you remembering that wisdom, the magic that you had as a child. I mean, I, when I first started practicing, I would have all these like random little memories, little magic moments from my childhood come up. And it was just little things in my subconscious mind kind of being released. But in doing so, it kind of helped me remember that girl who knew who she was, who before she got socialized, before she went through yeah. puberty and started to judge herself through the lens of society, through the lens of um, the patriarchy, if you will, right? Suddenly now I'm mm -hmm. being viewed as a woman and I'm going to judge my own body and I'm going to judge how everybody sees me or, or, or be overly concerned with that. When you were just your core, your essence of a being, um, how powerful you are. And when we get back to that, that is something, I mean, when I teach in shelters or I teach, um, you know, in various different circumstances with people I may never see again, what I say, the most basic level, if you remember nothing else from this experience, please know that when you close your eyes and you tune in to your third eye space and you deepen your breath, that you are connected to God, the universe, higher consciousness, whatever you want to call it but that was always there for you. And it's like electricity coming into the house. All you have to do is turn on that switch. All you have to do is go back. And I remember just people looking at me with tears in their eyes, you know, just because nobody had ever said to them, you already have it, you know, you're okay just as you are, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead it was, you must go to the church. You must follow these rules. You must believe in the dogma. You must do as we say. And if you don't, you're, you, you should be shamed and ridiculed and feel bad about yourself. How powerful when we can heal and we can come from a space as you are already holy if you just remember and believe that you are. The most freeing thing. So beautiful. It really is. And, and it is that, you know, it's the layers that we have to dig through, right. Of to try to, you know, that, that we've been trying to dig through to quote, remember who we are or hear our own voice. And at the end of the day, it's actually quite simple. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, it, it's actually quite simple. And, um, you know, what's not simple is what happens afterwards, right? I know that for me, and I hear this every day with my clients, and I'm sure you do too, that, you know, that when I say to them, hold on, what do you know? Mm -hmm. It's like a shot of light, right? Like they know it. And then it's, yeah, but, and, oh, but then this, and, you know, or, but like, or judging or all of the, the, the critic stuff that comes in, right? But man, when you say, what do you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the simplest thing. The answer that just comes shooting up, I think, and I, and I always imagine it as shooting up from your core center. Yeah. And that's the <laughs> right? thing, baby. That's it. Yeah. 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 It's a real thing. I love it. And I, I love to hear that this is already personally affecting you and that you now you know, have the time to give yourself um, a little more self-care and, and go into that space. It's wonderful. And I hope that more and more people will take that time to do it. And I'm having that experience. I'm offering these classes every day on Zoom. And, you know, I'm mm -hmm. having people who've never done it before saying, you know, they're, they're dealing with a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear right now. And they're saying to me, this is saving me right now. For myself, I just see the, the results, right? So and it's just, a, it, it's a continual miracle to me every day when I have new students or old students and, and I hear their stories and I hear what they're healing from, major addiction problems, major yeah, yeah. phobias, major um, psychological, psychiatric problems. When they're doing this inner work, um, they start to melt away. They, it's, it's almost like, people describe it this way, it's like, I still can remember it and I almost look for it in myself, that old feeling, that old, you know, 
Yes. Yes. Fear. Mm -hmm. And I just can't find it anymore. Mm. And that Mm -hmm. to me is the best way of explaining it because it really is like, I love that. It's just, it's just kind of like evaporated off you. That you did this inner work, you went deeper and you let go of whatever those that had kind of clogged your pipes, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever had kind Mm -hmm. of um, collected and you're just refining yourself. And in that refinement, clearing out those old stories or those old collected or projections that have been put on you by other people, right? um, Misunderstand ourselves. Mm-hmm. I call that process sometimes getting current with ourselves, right? That when we've gone through some kind of transformation, that when it's really organic and it's really happened, our brain is sometimes still holding on to the old way of being. And we start to act out of that. And then you're like, oh, that that's actually not who I am anymore. That's so weird, right? And we don't, there's that space totally. of getting current with the transformation, right? I love that. I love that. I love that experience. I love watching that happen in clients. And they're like, yeah, but I'm so confused. It's so weird. I'm like, yeah, you just haven't quite caught up to your own growth and healing yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're still you're, looking you're, for the old person, the old version. Right. Of yeah. yeah. I like that. I like that imagery too, of like, you're kind of looking for it in yourself and it's like, not there. Yeah. It's like, Whoa. where'd it go? <laughs> what? Where'd it go? <laughs> and, and then who am I without it? It's who you always want. And that's, yeah. Yes. Well, that's a huge one. I I remember experiencing that sort of when I was going through um, the you know early stages of of twelve step work, right? Where you get to a certain point where you've really kind of like identified and released all your character defects, right? And then you're sitting in the space of, but who am I without them? Because you haven't quite you haven't you haven't rebuilt yet, right? You've just stripped away. And then it's like, well, if I'm, if I am not those things, who the fuck am I, (laughs) you know? And there's a space that it feels like there's a space to sit in. And that's, you know, one of the things I love about 12 step work is this, is that, you know, there, there are a number of steps that are about becoming willing Mm -hmm. before going on to the next step. Right. It's, and it's, it's in that space of just sitting with and being with. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in our practice, addiction recovery is dealt with in in the most loving way that I've had ever heard of prior to it. And basically it comes Mm. from the belief that any compulsive behavior, i.e. addiction, right. That is Uh hurting you that you're doing, you know, habitually, um, and be it from the most benign to, you know, uh, you know, whatever, to the most da- heroin addiction or something like really deadly um, is ultimately just seeking the feeling of connection with God. Mm-hmm. It's just trying to remember that feeling of con- being connected to source of remembering that we, whatever we've lost along the way, trying to get back to that in that way. Um, those habits are really quite beautiful, right? I mean, obviously when they're self-destructive, that's obviously something you want to stop. But the, the, the want behind it is pure, is actually a beautiful thing. Yeah, I never really thought about being high as being, like we talk about a spiritual high, right? And so yeah. it's the same. But that's what you want when you get high. That's what you want when you get drunk. You want that feeling of elevated consciousness. And what has been the most exciting part of this journey for me is when I've reached that state in the practice of meditation, in the practice of the yoga, when I go into that ecstasy where I'm like, this is better than any high I've found anywhere Mm -hmm. else. And Mm -hmm. it's organic. It's there. Right. And to, to, it's so exciting to me, for me to be able to show that to people that you already have this. You just have to, again, flick on the switch know how to do it, find it in yourself. And it's always there. It's like a a, a never ending wellspring of source that you have within you. It's the coolest. And it it just thrills me to to get to see people find that in themselves. It's really cool. I I remember, um, you know, the first time I think that I 
really like that Kundalini became sort of really was in my um, sphere was when I first got sober. And there's a, uh, a woman that I follow who um, uses Kundalini in all of, in her programs. And she's a, she's, she's like a, you know, she's not an AA person and she's not anti, but she's very much like, you know, for people who don't identify in that way. Um, and she uses Kundalini in her programs yeah. and yeah. And now I, I can sort of see the connection yeah. uh, a little bit better. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Today's episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online counseling service. They counsel more people worldwide than any other online service available. And I love BetterHelp. They will assess your needs and they'll match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with a therapist in under 24 hours. This is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. This is professional counseling done securely online. The service is available to clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor, and you're going to get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. I'll tell you that I I know that I work with a lot of women who are not able to find a counselor in their area, right? Maybe they live in rural areas or it otherwise it's difficult for them to find a counselor and better help is probably your best bet out there. We have a special offer for the Divorce Survival Guide podcast listeners to get 10% off your first month. So go to betterhelp.com slash divorce survival guide. Now that's better help. H-E-L-P, and join the over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash divorce survival guide. We also, we were talking um, before, again, before we hit record about how um, Kundalini can be used to um, heal trauma. So I want to talk a little bit more about that because, well, because who doesn't want to heal their trauma? <laughs> and who doesn't have you know. And who doesn't have it? Yeah. Yeah. So how does that work? For your audience, you know, um, the uh-huh. trauma of a divorce, the trauma of a relationship um, ending and or yeah. graduating, right? To see with a little more... Uh, eagle eye vision, right? So in in our practice, we describe it this way, that you have three minds. You have your positive mind, which just helps you get out of bed every day. And the negative mind, which helps you from running into traffic, right? You have the discernment Mm -hmm. quality. And then the neutral mind, which I prefer to call the authentic mind, because it's really the most true part of yourself. But if you think about it as kind of an eagle eye view, it's seeing the forest for the trees. It's having that overall perspective. We see things not as they are, but as we are. So all of us, to some degree, are looking at life through dirty windshields, right? Right. We all have a lot of bugs and a lot of leaves and a lot of gunk. So to varying degrees and at varying times, you know, throughout our life, right? Um, What is amazing to me about this practice is that it helps you clear out a lot of that fog, right? A lot of that Mm -hmm. gunk because you are getting into your more neutral nature. And in doing so, by meditating, by focusing at your third eye, by finding a deeper breath, by connecting to something more profound in yourself, you're less reactive. You're taking things less personally. You're seeing the forest for the trees. This isn't about me, right? You can therefore step back from a relationship that no longer served you or a heartbreak that took you down and say, okay, honestly, what was the lesson in this? What does my soul need to learn from this? If I, you know, we, in the yogic perspective, lives that we kind of pre-chose for ourselves because it was going to present us with opportunities and obstacles that would help our soul grow. If you think about it that way, each thing that happens, we can say, thank you. 
no matter how painful. How can mm-hmm. I grow from this? What can I learn from this? And a relationship okay. ending is a chapter closing, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it doesn't always have to be a tragedy. In fact, sometimes it's quite a blessing. I'm sure you've heard that many, many, many times, right? I, I've experienced it. <laughs> and, and also, what would you have told yeah. yourself while you were in the middle mm-hmm. of it, right? Right. You mm-hmm. had that eagle eye perspective while you were going through it, right? And that's mm-hmm. the yoga mm-hmm. approach. That's the more spiritual way of looking at our lives that can help us in the moment of trauma not to spiritually bypass. That's not to say to like disconnect or like, like I'm not going to feel anything. No, feel. Yes. But go through yep. it with wisdom. Go through it with less victim mentality, less reactivity. Yeah. I want to, I want to actually uh, go back over that track a few times about spiritual bypassing, yeah. because I think that this is a really important place to sort of drop in here. Right. Because we can so often say like, well, oh, everything happens for a reason, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, and it invalidates people's experiences totally. and it invalidates the real trauma and pain that they may be going through by sort of just, you know, oh, you know, give it up to God or it's God's plan or your soul's purpose. And that's not what you're talking no. about. And I would no. just want to be like no. super clear. No. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's so important to differentiate that because that is the bypassing is that like, just stay in joy. And life is, we live in a duality, right? We're in a, a third dimension has all yes. things. And we are meant the positive vibes only. No, like, no. <laughs> there is, there, in, in that, in that dialogue, in that rhetoric, there's a lot of um, blaming, right? And shaming, right? That, if you go into your emotions or feel your feelings that you're somehow not um, doing your work, right? That's not what we're talking about. I really, I encourage people to go through your dark places, but with consciousness just means an understanding that there is a, a way through this first and foremost, and that to not be afraid of the dark places in the same way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think that that's, yes. And I love that. Right. Because I do think in spiritual bypassing, there is a, there's a jumping over of the darkness and there's like a, there's a mm, ignoring that the darkness is actually happening. Um, and, and so, right. So, so we're jumping over that dark place and there is so much information Mm -hmm. in the darkness. We do not want to, one of my values years ago when I was doing first doing values work, I have a value called mud bath. Mm -hmm. Um, My mud bath value, which is about the fact that I truly value going into those dark places. Like it, like going to a spa and getting mud, like, you know, mud and shit, like rubbed all over you. And then you get sloughed off and like, holy moly, you're like, totally renewed and regenerated. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can't get that if you don't go into the darkness. Mm -hmm. And if you jump over it in that way that the, you know, here's something that I've, that I've noticed Mm -hmm. in the spiritual bypass community Mm -hmm. is there's a lot of angry people. Oh, totally. It's just, it's like, it's a latent. Yeah. Yes. It's a latent repressed anger and you'll see it flare up in their defense of their love and light, uh, you know, practice or preaching. Right. And that's the problem is that if we don't go into the darkness, if we don't actually be in that anger, if we don't safely, and as you say, consciously with consciousness, feel the, feel the hard quote, dark, whatever feelings, Mm -hmm. they're going to be there, but they're going to be in really unconscious destructive leaky ways for sure and that's when we get sick that's where illness has fertile ground to root in when we yep, deny the feeling and when we especially as women try to make ourselves smaller and try to make ourselves more agreeable and more yes. palatable for somebody else and the worst thing that we can do is be angry an angry yes. woman is very threatening to our society so we mm-hmm. dim that in ourselves um i think because an angry woman is powerful, <laughs> powerful as fuck. Oh, watch out, right? 
Mm-hmm. And that is the Kali Ma energy. Yes, right? exactly. And, yes. You know, Kali, Kali Ma, the goddess, the Hindu goddess, check, look her, check her out if you don't know much about her, but she's often misunderstood because she is a justifiable rage. She is Mother right. Earth saying, hell no more Brazilian wild, you know, uh, rainforest fires. Hell no more the entire continent of Australia being on fire. No more. Yeah. Right? And that right. within us, every woman carries that necessary power. I often describe her. So when I teach my women's retreats, I always spend Saturday night doing this, this meditation called Adi Shakti. Mm-hmm. Adi Shakti is this mother power energy. It is the ferociousness of the mother, right? Because nothing is more powerful in nature than a mother protecting her young, right? You Uh, don't mess with the mama bear, right? Right, right. In this meditation, they talk about this goddess Bhagavati. Bhagavati Mm -hmm. is represented a female form with eight arms, which we all wish we had, right? (laughs) We could use them. In four of her hands, she's holding blessings, gifts, Mm -hmm. offerings. In four of her hands, she's holding weapons. So it is the, and she's, oh, did I mention she's balancing on the back of a tiger, right? Mm, Like mm -hmm. Of course she is. Of course, yeah. (laughs) With her four, you know, her eight arms. And the truth being, it is the balance of those two things that is the feminine, right? That we are the nurturers. We are the life givers. We are the creative force on this planet. And we will also be... Mo- there's, you know, mother, the power of mother nature, the, the, the ferocity of a mother protecting her young, there is nothing more powerful than that. And right. so it, in that balance, what have we forgotten as human women? What have we forgotten that feroce, that ferociousness within us by being subdued into being agreeable and likable and smaller? Yeah. And if we can, as spiritual women, own our anger own the ferociousness, that is the way we will make not only personal transformations, but we will transform society. The more of us who wake up into that, and that is my personal mission in waking that up and helping that in all my sisters to remember, not to deny, not to bypass, not to stay happy and be Mm -hmm. friendly to everyone. Yes, always be kind, but there's a way to be truthful and kind. And so many women I know have throat chakra issues. So Mm -hmm. many women have thyroid problems because they have been clamped down, literally been shut down in their throats. So true. and so powerful. It's so damn powerful. And, you know, we obviously share this mission, right? (laughs) And And it's not just, it's not just, I want you, neither one of us wants women to unleash their anger, right? It's, we want you to process it and accept it and feel it and and work with it and into it, right? We don't want everyone just going home and started screaming at their husbands is basically what I'm saying, right? <laughs> like that's not what no, 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 no. And that's not, that's more reactivity. That's not, mm-hmm. because anger is a necessary fire in the belly, right? Um, it's the way that we can, again, justifiable anger is, there's nothing wrong with that. And what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that you're going to go commit acts of violence or, or be unnecessarily cruel and, and, you know, reactive in your life. It just means what are you going to do with that energy when you feel it? How? So going into alchemy, right? The transmutative Mm -hmm. quality, right? Yeah. What can you do with anger that then transmutes it into gold? Tap into when you are conscious and you are on a spiritual path by becoming more in that neutral, authentic self. You can start to take those crap that life hands you and turn it into a fire in your belly that then creates magic in your life. I love it. It's, I mean, it's so, it's so powerful, right? It's like, that's it. That's it. Right? The meaning of life. That's literally it. And to get to help people in that process is the greatest honor I feel I can have. Like I I couldn't want for anything else. So, you know, the combination of being a teacher and, you know, I call it a spiritual life coach, but, you know, helping people, okay, well now what, right? So, you know, it's not that we deny our, our, our pain, not that we're denying the circumstances, but 
What are we going to do with it? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the most powerful way you can help people. Absolutely. Since you just touched on alchemy, let's talk about sexual alchemy and what, how, how does that, how does this translate there or how does it connect or I don't know. What yeah. is that? So What's sexual, alchemy? sexual alchemy and it's not only healing the second chakra, which is our sex organs. It's also called the mm. sacral chakra and transmute that energy into manifestation into mm. using your power, your sexual power, especially as women and creating from that space. So not just the act, not just the getting off in sex, yeah. potency of what that creative force is when we harness it. Mm. So the dialogues that I've been having on this podcast range from, you know, it starts from healing, right? Because that's first and foremost where we need to start looking at the sacral chakra as a society. I mean, to think that just 2018 that we started to look around at each other and go, you, you too? Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. You got sexually harassed. You were treated like a piece of meat. You were treated like subhuman. Me too. Yeah. And that's not okay. Right. But how long as women were we putting up with this shit? How long were we telling our daughters? That's just what men do. You're just going to, Oh, it's a compliment when you, you know, boys will be boys. Yeah. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. We finally are now saying to our daughters, no, you don't mm -hmm. have to put up with that anymore. You don't mm -hmm. have to be relegated to the whims and desires of someone else. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, the tip of the iceberg in many ways, but it's also a tipping point because we're now starting to look around at each other and linking arms as women, not against yeah. men. Right. The most important thing to point out is when we heal, they heal. Mm. And we all need yeah. to be healed. We are yes. either still in this, in our, in our relationship to sexuality as a society, and I'm talking Western society right now, um, totally still repressed or anxious or weird about our sexuality to some degree, right. or mm -hmm. on the opposite end of the spectrum, completely objectified and pornographied, yeah. right? That we have right. these, these, there doesn't seem to be much of a balance of what does healthy sexuality look like? What is, how do we explain that to our children? How do we model it as a society? And then what, right? So that's just base level. Yeah. But then how can we start from a consensual basis and then move upward, get into a space where sexuality can be magical in a loving yeah. relationship, in a loving relationship with yourself, how can we start to rethink and redefine sex? And what would that look like as a society? Mm. Those are the questions that I'm delving into. I love it. It's really I love cool. I'm, you know, and God, it just brings up so many things, you know, because, you know, we talked about how a woman, uh, a woman's anger is mm -hmm. one of the most powerful things, right? Right. So much sexuality. Woo! It is. I mean, and it's, it's right. It's the most powerful thing. And it is the also so um, uh, I think challenging and frightening for for men, you know, because you know that men's sexuality is fairly simple and straightforward in many ways. Straightforward being a <laughs> totally intentional pun, um, whereas ours is so complex and you know and so different and so varied. Right. And a woman owning her own sexual power. Well, like, let's face it, like it's so terrifying to the patriarchal structures that, that, that we're called, you know, slut, we're slut shamed for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, women's sex work is illegal. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's like women actually having active choice in their, about their bodies and how they use it sexually is actually <laughs> illegal. Yeah. Um, reproductive freedoms are very threatened. And are reproductive. Oh. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because the, you know, women's sexuality is quite miraculous in many ways. It is. And so it's miracle. very yeah. threatening. Yeah. Well, one of my friends, when I, I had my children, my first son, my child, 
I remember feeling like a walking nerve ending. I remember I just couldn't explain what happened to me. Cause I'm like, yeah, I don't know. And one of my dear friends who's a healer said, but think about it as a woman, you are a conduit to the universe. You literally drew life down from source through your body and transmitted it into this earthly plane. Of course, you're going to feel sensitive. You are an access point to God. And I was like, yes, like that was the most beautiful way of explaining it. And if we think of ourselves as that, that we have this power within us, that the vagina is literally an entranceway to a universe. How beautiful, you know, how profound, how sacred. And how differently would we think about ourselves? How differently would we think about that sharing that with another person, right? I want to talk about the fact that like, yes, sharing that, like we, as women, I think um, we discredit the power that that has and we give it away in such random and disrespectful way, disrespectful of our own power, right? And I don't mean, right? So that if we, you're right, if we, if we honor our own power, our own sexual power, mm-hmm. um, and that power that you're talking about as being this sort of conduit to a, to a universe, mm-hmm. um, we might really think differently about who we allow inside of our being. Sure. But I would right. also say, and you know, I, I think there are, it, you know, we, I just had this discussion with my, my, um, the group that I'm leading to become teachers right now, but we were mm-hmm. talking about um, conscious sexuality in that way. And that there's a lot of, again, kind of control of women in terms of the spiritual world, like, well, um, that, you know, there's an imprinting when a woman sleeps with a man that he imprints on her auric space. Um, But truly, the more sensitive we all become, because I would say that when men become more spiritually sensitive too, they recognize that when you're combining the portals that open in sexuality with another person, that you are attaching energetically to them, right? Right. Whether we recognize it or not, the more subtle we become, the more we recognize that it's happening. I have a male friend who said, I would not sleep with anyone who I wouldn't want to be. Oh, interesting. And that's from a male perspective, I think is really cool, right? Because he's recognizing the energetic exchange, the power and potency of sexual energy and the combination of such. It's really really cool, right? Yeah, Yeah, it's really cool. There was something else I wanted to uh, touch on about that and the power and the patriarchy and how threatening it is. And I can't remember what the specific... I think that if we viewed ourselves differently, if if we actually took on that, mm, that lens, Mm -hmm. even, even for a moment, right. Mm -hmm. If everyone could just sort of take on mm, that point of view for just a minute, right. Like what if you were this ultimate source and this sort of this conduit and this pathway, Mm -hmm. how might you, make your decisions? How might you view yourself? Mm-hmm. How might you demand to be treated by others? And and maybe command is a better word than demand, right? Because I don't think we think of ourselves that way. For sure. Because also, like I, you know, we talk a lot about, many studies have been done about how, you know, especially with women, um, their self-worth radically shifts around puberty, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly Mm -hmm. they were seeing themselves as just beings. I'm just a person to now I'm a woman and I'm a woman in this society. And I'm a woman under a lens where if my body doesn't look this way, I should feel shame. And I'm in a woman in a society where, you know, all the different layers of conditioning and media and culture and religion and family. And, you know, that what starts to happen to our sexuality is very important, right? Because suddenly now sex becomes about validation, right? Self-worth, pleasing others. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, when I think about in terms of my own daughter or, or younger women, how to, A, first and foremost, like 
hopefully more and more are coming from a place of just base level consent, right? Mm -hmm, Let's mm -hmm. start there. Yeah. Let's start there. So we don't have to start from the negative of undoing trauma to the sacral chakra. Isn't that amazing? How many of us are just trying to undo trauma? Yeah. Me. Absolutely. You know, fuck. Right. So. Right. Let's start there. If you're not coming from a place of trauma and you're not coming from a place of shame and you're taught that your body is a celebration and it's a sacred, beautiful expression of God, how differently would you think about sex? I mean, I can't even imagine, but that's yeah. the world that I want to start to explore. That's the world that I would love future generations to get to experience. And I think we're, we are, like you said, we are seeing it in these, in these younger kids, right? It's f- phenomenal to see it in so many of them. And, and some of them, you know, we still see the, you know, yeah, um, the shame. The and, Instagram models that you're all, gone, all freaking comparing yourself to and filters and you know, airbrushing and all that shit. But. We have that, but then we also have like a whole generation of, of teenagers who were like, yep, this is who I am. Right. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I think about in Hollywood too, because I was an actress, as I know you were for years, Yeah, that the role models are now in their 50s and 60s. And these are the women on the cover of the magazines. In the 70s yeah. and 80s, you never saw women of that God, age. No. No, 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 no. never. A whole never. other respect for Middle age and older women that thank God, but we never had that. So that's hopeful. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. it is. It is. We're, you know, I think there, there are so many um, sort of ingredients that we're throwing in the pot now that are sort of creating something different. And, um, but again, that sexy doesn't it. mean you have to be 25. Yeah. You know, or super skinny or, right. exactly. you know, Right. We're, we're fitting or white the, the check boxes that, that have been prescribed. And so in that way, when women start to open up to feeling sexually confident at whatever age, um, mm-hmm. and then recognizing that pleasure is, I mean, what if we saw in, in the same way as we were talking about addiction, right? If you're finding pleasure as an expression of communing with the divine, rather than just a dirty act that you do that you have, you know, right. what a different way of relating to it. What a different way of, of understanding that that energy is God energy, that you are a goddess in that moment. Yeah. And what a different way that we would actually be engaged in the act of it. Right. Cause if, you know, I think so many of us had sex for so many, you know, reasons and, and ways that were literally not that, <laughs> You know, mostly like to get love or, you know, um, whereas like if, oh my God, like I would have sex in a completely different way mm-hmm. if that was the outcome, right. you know, but imagine versus being taught that as right. a girl. Oh my God. I want to be, I want to be taught that now. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, I, I'm making this podcast and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm having all these different people and not only people who have healed sexual trauma, but experts who have helped women do that. And then really getting into work as we go along more and more about how expansive the energy can be, right? Mm-hmm. How beautiful and how um, it is your birthright to experience sexual pleasure and um, allow for that vibration to exist on this planet. I always say that to people when they're like, well, what good is my meditating going to do to save the world, right? But the truth is, if you think of things as scales, right, there's so much pain and suffering in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So anytime you increase your vibration just by a notch, and then I increase my vibration by a notch, and a few other people do, right? We start to create more space on the world for that vibration to exist, right? And in the same way, if you start to heal, and I start to heal and more and more women start to heal the sacred, sacral chakra. Oh, yeah. What collectively can happen and welcoming our brothers, our men into that mm-hmm. space, welcoming them into that healed vibration of sexuality, we are healing them 
Yes. And that's, you know, that's a conversation that I have a lot with my friends when we're talking about, you know, all of this shit, right. That we're constantly talking about where and how do we invite men into these conversations? Yes. Not about blaming and, and us against them. That's not helpful at all. Not at all. Not at all. Um, and so how and where do we make that invitation and into what are we inviting them? Well, and it's to your point earlier too, about how threatening it can feel to men, how powerful women's sexuality is because right. we are the life bearers, right? That, that they cannot reproduce. We have right. that biggest, you know, the subconscious reaction of the male is, yeah, of course I, I want to, I want to own that for myself. I want to control that. I, I, I can imagine as a woman, if I'm relating energetically, that would feel very threatening. I don't have that within myself. Right. So how can we relate in an, I don't want to say non-threatening, but in a way that is inclusive yeah, and safe for men to feel that a woman's power is safe. We have to heal first. A wounded woman who is not healed yes. is the angry, yes. scary yes. aspect that we don't want to go into, right? Exactly. That is yep. the unhealed mother who damages her children, right? Yep. Right. So exactly. Exactly. First and foremost, as women, we have to come own our anger, transmute it, and heal it, and then invite men into that healed womb. Right. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I feel like we could, again, like have this conversation all day. Um, but <laughs> it's big stuff. It, it, it is big stuff. It is huge stuff. Um, but so tell us, tell us where we can, where everyone can find you, where they can listen to your podcast and do this healing work for themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, the podcast is launched. It's on iTunes and Spotify now. It's called Sexual Alchemy uh, with Daya Carr, which is my uh, spiritual name, D-Y-A-K-A-U-R. Um, follow me on Instagram, Sexual Alchemy with Daya Carr or Libby Hudson Lidecker. Uh, Libby Lidecker, I believe, is my handle on Instagram. So, uh, and reach out. Um, you can DM me for coaching sessions. I teach privates via Zoom or I'm in the Los Angeles area. I teach at Wanderlust and Yoga West. Yay. And right now she's teaching on Zoom. <laughs> so DM me and join the, join the fun, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Yeah. All right. Libby, thank you so much for having this conversation. I just, I just love it. I adore you. I'm so happy to have you in my world. And Oh, Kate, I'm so honored and I'm so glad that we have found each other and uh, it's all meant to be. So yeah, thank you. Me too. I'm really grateful. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.